What is going on, guys? We are live. We are live. We're going to get started with today's episode in about two more minutes, guys. Two more minutes. I know we just went live on Facebook, so we'll give everybody a chance to hop on. Today, today's episode of Down the Rabbit Hole with Bruce Neal, me, your host, right, uh, is simulation theory, right? It's, it's the look, we got the movie The Matrix Part Four coming out uh, literally uh, very soon. I'm super excited. And, um, you know, also we have some interesting, you know, things that Elon Musk is saying, things that even scientists are saying, theories. And I think, I think this is a topic that maybe isn't talked about enough. And maybe it's a scary topic for some. Maybe for some people it's like, you know, it stretches their minds so much that they're just like, whoa, nah, no way. There's no way, right? Like that's the number one thing you would typically hear, right? For most people when you talk about something like this, they're like, nah, no way. But it is, uh, it is hard to argue against it being a possibility when you start to dive deep down this rabbit hole and learning more and more about it from so many different sources and different people's opinions and what they're saying and on their podcasts and science mixed with it and all types of stuff. It starts to become very hard to deny that it, that it can be a very, very much a big possibility. Okay, and we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to start off with, you know, the legend in the making himself, Elon Musk. I mean, this guy is, he's like, I don't know. He's like a superhuman or something like that. He's like a robot. He's like a, he's like a high tech, super high tech AI or something. I don't know. But um, he had interesting, you know, it, it, multiple interviews, even one with Joe Rogan. I definitely recommend you guys go check that one out. You know, 15 minutes long of, on this video when he's talking about the simulation theory or a little bit with Joe Rogan. We also have this short one right here that I wanted to play just so you can hear his response, right? And then we're gonna talk about it. There we go, that's perfect. Wow, that's incredible. Use this sale to send money to friends and family pretty much wherever they bank is incredible. I should, yeah, I should pay for red, right? No commercials. Your Guys, I mean, this is a interesting, interesting, uh, there's a interview here. Um, sort of a philosophic concept that a sufficiently advanced civilization will be able to create uh, so a simulation. simulation. Yeah, maybe you've answered this before. A simulation. I've had so many simulation discussions. It's crazy. Okay. Um, so, because because in fact, it, it got to the point where basically every conversation was was the AI AI slash simulation conversation. Um, and my brother and I finally agreed that um, we would ban such conversations if we were ever in a hot tub. Okay. That was like. <laughs> Is that really <laughs> um, so, so, so the idea is right. Any sufficiently advanced civilization would create, could create a simulation that's like our existence, and so the theory follows that may, maybe we're in the simulation. Have you thought about this? And a lot. Are we? <laughs> are we? Even in a hot tub. So are much so, it has to be banned from a hot tub. Okay, it's not the sexiest conversation. Are we in? Are we in? Uh, the, 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 I mean, I think here's, in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously and it's getting better every year and soon we'll have you know virtual reality like augmented reality um if you assume any rate of improvement at all um then the games will become indistinguishable from reality just in, indistinguishable um even if that rate of investment drops by a thousand from what it is right now um then you just say okay well, well let's imagine it's a 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be, you know, billions of such, uh, you know, computers with set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. Ooh. 
So I mean, what's wrong with that argument? Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably. I mean, it's like, is there is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone, but someone. I'm not that. sure what the error. In... Right, no, no, the argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it, and this is a game. No, no, there's a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this, that seems to be like clearly. Well. Exactly, guys. So, like, like really think about it. You know, I don't know how old you are, but like, I grew up where there was Atari, you know, Nintendo, Super Nintendo. Um, and I remember how these systems were. I remember the graphics. And I remember when PlayStation 1 came out. And I remember I played. Resident Evil Part Two, I think it was, where where it really showed me that wow, the graphics can go next level. Where you know it wasn't the in-play game graphics because those were actually even those were giant leap from where it was at, but it was more the in-between scenes and movie scenes, whatever that they did, uh, showed me the improvement in graphics, how realistic they can get. And uh, since then, we've just seen crazy progression, right? You can literally live, you know, in another reality. There's people out there who actually talk about you know these game realities that they these reality they're like realities these video games right they talk about them as if it was a, a real experience real life real you know that's their world right there's people out there who really talk about what what they have accomplished and and you know the the life they're living in in gta right so gaming is definitely big it's definitely huge it's definitely been a part of um i guess you could say life for most people you know uh different ages some people never abandon their gamer right they still play games to this day and they went through the evolution they see all that progress and we always knew from way back then when they started to make it better and sega genesis and playstation we knew already man games are going to become indistinguishable from reality we already had that feeling like we're, so eventually it's going to look like us you know like regular that good uh on a video game playing with a character and it's already basically almost there you know it's scary sometimes some of these games especially the scenes the movie scenes or whatever they're very very much realistic i mean they have drops of sweat now <laughs> it's crazy so now we have virtual reality games where you could put you know those whatever you want to call those right that headgear on right and you literally will feel like you're in this game based on just your emotional reactions to it because it's in front of your vision. Now that's just your vision. When you start getting basically to the point where you can include the, the, the normal senses, the five senses that we have into that, then it gets more and more realistic, right? You ever went to uh, Disneyland, you'll know that some of these, um, some of these things, some of these uh, games, Star Wars games, whatever, or, or machines, whatever you want to call it, rides that you get on, they add your other senses to it. It's not just a visual. They start adding things, right, to make it feel, it feels so realistic, right? Um, so imagine where you create a virtual reality game that you can put yourself into, but we have technology. To, well, we already have kind of that type of technology right, right now. For example, think about it. When someone's in a coma, um, they're not, they're not dead. They're, they're just in a big, you know, maybe a big, 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 big dream. Right. And that's another topic we're going to get to dreams. Right. But, um, they're like in a big, big dream, but we're able to sustain them alive. Right. You basically can keep sustaining. You got all these tubes connected to them to feed them proper nutrients, all the stuff they need for the body to keep going. And, and, you know, of course we have technology to activate muscles, even if you're not moving them so that you can stay, you know, tone and fit or whatever so we have a lot of technology as is so imagine you know having the ability to step into a virtual reality game and be connected to this overall technology that also takes care of all the other things you would have to take care of if your if your body was say in a coma or sleeping right feeding it all that stuff well at that point how would you know if you're in a real in a real reality or not if you're not waking up from the other reality if you're in that video game and longer and longer and longer, it's like, how would you even know? Like, you wouldn't know really, you know? And what if you created this video game in a way where when you hop into the video game, when you get into the simulation, right? Because who knows, maybe this is, like Elon said, the only reason why we'd probably cre create a simulation reality is for, for maybe because base reality is boring, right? So just imagine that could be a very much a big possibility.
right? You're just living experience. And maybe the average lifespan here, 80 to 100 years is different than real lifetime, right? Because timing is always different. Think about your dreams. Time is different in your dreams. Time is not the same as in this reality, second by second, minute by minute. It's way different in a dream. It almost seems like time can be manipulated based on just what you're able to do, where you're able to go all in the same time spans. Like you're not even walking places really. I mean, it's not that you're not walking. It's just like when you want to go somewhere in a dream, you just pop up there. So timing is different. And you've heard, you've heard concepts of movies like Inception or whatever, where they're talking about the dream and how, you know, so much, a little bit of time can happen. Um, let's say you're, you're awake eight hours, but that same eight hours in the dream world with the way it's time works is like a day or beyond or whatever, right? Some whatever exaggerated number. So imagine that's also true for, for a virtual reality simulation game where we get to that point of advanced technology. Let's just, you know how when you take a, a car drive somewhere, or, you know, and you're not driving, what do you do to pass the time? You, you entertain yourself, right? You start scrolling and stuff. You start watching movies. You start playing video games, right? You're entertaining yourself because the base reality is boring, right? Who the hell likes to just sit in a car without music or without some kind of entertainment, just driving somewhere? Very few people like to just sit and do that and meditate or whatever. But most people, they want some kind of entertainment going. So what if, hypothetically speaking, you're on your way somewhere that's very, very far, very, 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 very far. And turns out 80 to hundred years in this reality really isn't that much time in base reality. <laughs> and you're just, and you're just having a nice, a nice experience right now, you know, or a interesting experience because the overall human experience is basically very interesting when you really think about it. It's a very interesting experience overall. Right. So let's really think about this. Right, because we already have some of the uh, tech, we have technology already moving in that direction. And then we have movies like The Matrix. We we're just talking about how part four is about to come out. We have movies like The Matrix. Let's really think about that. You know, like The Matrix scenario was what? Humans were connected to the simulation reality because in reality they were being used as a battery because once upon a time they created some, you know, very intelligent. AI that they went to battle with and boom, the AI won and ended up using humans as batteries because humans have a certain amount of electricity going uh, that they're able to produce naturally uh, and they use us as batteries, right? Which is a very interesting concept. But in the movie, they used to connect them. They connected them to the simulation, to the, re, uh, to the simulation through, through connections through their body and one mainly right in the back of the head. Right, right in the back of the head, and, and it seems like it goes right to the middle of, of your brain almost because how, how long that thing is. It looks like you, you'll kill somebody there, but I guess not, right? Now you have guys like Elon Musk right now as we speak already creating something called Neuralink, right, where you'll be able to put a chip inside your brain in certain areas to regain mobility in an arm or a leg that lost its ability to, you know, for you to control it. So we already are seeing signs of, cyborg type stuff that we saw in movies early on and of course we also know most of the stuff we saw in movies early on already started to happen and happen already so now we see this happening it's kind of like cyborg ish right where you you are connected to some kind of technology in your brain in your body that's amazing i mean it's a good there's good benefits to that i mean for people who lost you know the ability to use certain arms legs whatever stuff like that they can get this little chip and it's gonna they're gonna it's gonna get them back to normal that's powerful stuff, but it's already showing you that it is possible to connect yourself or ourselves to technology. We already see it going that direction, right? Then you see guys like um, physicists, quantum physicists, um, Michu Kaku, I'm hoping I pronounced this right. Uh, he, I remember I was watching a documentary. He was saying how they're inventing some contact lens that you put in your eye and, and then it literally can, can connect you to like search engine browsers, internet, stuff like that. And I'm just like, what is what do we look at the direction we're going in everything we saw in the movies right but at the same time if that's the case then what if ultimately at the end of this reality for a very few people you know they discover that this is a matrix that this is a simulated reality it's hard to argue against it guys what defines real how often have you been confused about what is real in your own life with your own perceptions as is right now? How many times have you been off? How many times have you been right, wrong? 
I don't think anyone really knows a, a, a true definition of real. How do we define real? Morpheus said it best. How do you define real? We define real as what? Just sensory messages happening between our senses and stuff like that. Right? Most people only believe what they can see. And there's a lot of things that are real that you can't see. So at the same time, there's good chances, you know, based on a lot of different things, this could easily be a simulated reality, guys. And there's no way in hell you can tell. The, there's no way you can tell it isn't or it is. Think about it. Think about it from an Inception's point of view with Leonardo DiCaprio. They had to kill themselves to get back closer to base reality. I want you to think about something. I think, who was it? Was it Michu Kaku? Somebody said that another good sign that would, would tell us that we're possibly in a simulated reality right now would be if we got to the point in this reality where we're able to create simulated realities. And aren't we on our way there? Like Elon just said, wouldn't that be evidence? So how would we, we, how would we know we're not in base reality or, or, or not? We wouldn't know. How would we know? If we, look, imagine this. Imagine we are not in the simulated reality, okay? But then we get technology to the point, like I mentioned earlier, where we could put ourselves into a virtual reality game, like when you're in a coma almost, and have your body taken care of for the duration of the body's existence. But you're living a different reality experience in this simulated reality. And let's just say in that simulated reality, you made it very much similar to base reality in a sense of, you know, kind of being human, able to create, able to invent all this stuff, right? With these basic laws of the universe. And you jump into that reality. And, with, and in that reality, you create a system to take care of your body in the, <laughs> in the last reality. Couldn't you just keep going into, into simulated realities almost infinitely? So it makes you think about how they say there's, all, there's ultimate, alternate dimensions. There's many dimensions. There's many realities. There's many possibilities. Quantum physicists talk about this all the time. So it makes you really think. How would you ever know it's based reality? In Inception, they had to kill themselves and then they, they still went to another reality. They killed themselves again, another reality. It was hard sometimes how to, to get back to base reality. They used to get confused sometimes to the point where that girl, the main character, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, wife or whatever, that's how she ended up really killing herself because she, got, she just got, became obsessed with trying to find base reality. She kept killing herself, you know? I don't know if you guys remember, but I don't remember all the movie because it was a while ago, but I remember certain parts like that. So these are topics I always think about. Like, think about it. Dreaming feels real. Dreaming. When our body is not even operating, we're not even consciously at that moment who we are in this reality right now. We are somewhere else doing other things. And most times you guys only remember your dreams, but yet you are somewhere else for eight, seven, six hours, whatever you sleep. You are somewhere else, a whole different experience. And it, and it does feel like your senses are involved, right? You're, it does feel like your senses are involved. So if you were stuck in a dream, how would you ever know that that's not real? Think about that. You know, what, what defines real? Now, there's another thing I wanted to to bring up here, um, it's a scientist. His name is James Gates, I believe. And man, you got to hear this. I put it on a short video re recently. Um, you got to hear what he has been working on, what he thinks he discovered. Um, it's it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. I want to play it for you guys here, just in case you haven't heard it. I'm trying to find where it is. I know I found this video the other day. There's a whole bunch of videos. Here we go. So pay attention to this, guys. This is a credible scientist. You know, these are all these are all theories. Like we can't say they're proven, but all right, we just pause that sound for now. So I'm able to skip. I know I should have read. I don't know why I don't, to be honest, but I'm going to get it. Skip trial. These are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that- Wait, hold on. I want the real interview where, where he shows his video. Hold on one second, guys. I, I clicked on the wrong video. There's a video where he actually is, um, I'm not sure why that one's not it, to be honest. That was the same one, I think, last time.
Okay. You know what? Let's just listen to it. Um, it's only five minutes. It will still at least be the audio of it. But um, this is it. It's New York City. It's March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. These are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that, because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes, just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. You're saying that your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah. our computers. That is correct. So, no wait, I'm still quiet. I have to just be silent for a minute here. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code rich in the fabric of the cosmos into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos. he made that clear computer code computer code strings of bits of ones and zeros it's not just sort of resembles computer code you're saying it is computer code it's not even just is computer code it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named claude shannon in the 1940s that's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we would probably say are super symmetric. Some of those codes are showing on the screen behind you right now. They don't look like codes, but these pictures, which we call adinkras, are graphical representations of sets of equations that are based on codes. That in the description of our universe, that is a super symmetrical universe, which we want to test in the LHC. If you believe that description, I can show you the presence of these codes. That's my statement. Do you have any uh, predictions in your ideas or any ways to test any of your ideas any more than, say, the guy on the screen? <laughs> the work that I'm doing is, in fact, so theoretical that we don't, we don't understand yet whether it is even possible to complete the program. We have found these strange graphs. We know that they are equivalent to equations, and we have found in these equations computer codes. And so that's where we are right now. So I cannot give you a prediction. This work is less than two years old. But you, but it's not that you never, you recognize that you would need a prediction in order to. As I, someone recently asked me, said we- We'll just wrap it up right there. But guys, so, you know, like uh, Neil deGrasse said, he said you found code in, in written in the fabric of of the cosmos well he said he said no but he said based on the equations and stuff that we're using to explain that right what makes that based on those equations is where he found the ones and zeros and i found interesting that if he would have just found ones and zeros i think it'd still be pretty like wow you know but he found a specific type of code that came from somebody in 1940 so that means like it's a specific code. It's not too random then. Um, and you know, this, this hasn't been going on for, you know, this, I guess you would say this uh, research hasn't been going on for, for even a decade yet. So who knows how much progress they're going to make with this, with this information here. I think it's, it's interesting. I think it's very powerful. And just like he said, if you are a person who believes in these theories, as far as the, the, the equations they're levered, they're using to explain this, um, he can show you the ones and the zeros. So I find that extremely interesting. It's, it's why would it be, why would he find this in the first place? In my opinion, why would he find the same exact, you know, like the same type of ones and zeros you would find on search engine browsers, your internet. Why would he find this code written in deep in the equations of what we're using to explain the universe, the cosmos, that is, to me, there, there can't be a coincidence there. That can't really be that random. A specific type of code. Not just a random made up code that doesn't exist. A specific type of code that already exists, was already discovered, already used to create search engine browsers. Inside these equations, that's crazy to me. Now they got to consider and still call it a theory because the overall equations are labeled basically, the whole thing is labeled a theory. 
But to me, finding those ones and zeros in a specific type of code within those equations cannot be a coincidence. To me, it is, it is, look, it is hard to start. If it's starting to get really hard to argue against the possibility of us living in a simulated reality. It really is. I mean, when you really watch Matrix Part 1, especially, and you really pay attention to everything they say and everything they do, and it's, it's, you, you start just, your mind starts to stretch. You start to be like, you start to question things, right? It's, it's, it's crazy. To me, it's not like, and I said this before, I had a, I used to put, produce a lot of content, like, you know, one minute videos, few minute videos. And I remember I made a, a video once where I was talking about how, like, imagine, right? Think about this. Your brain has like thousands and thousands and thousands of thoughts, right? A lot. And a lot of feelings and emotions throughout the day. Now you're only going to, based on like the laws and self-development topics you might've studied, your, your law of attraction, right? You're going to attract and, and live experiences that are from the most dominant feeling and thought, which makes sense to me because we live in this specific type of time-based reality where there's sleeping six to eight hours and you only have 16 hours that you're, you know, up and, and about in this reality. It makes sense to me based on that many Think about how long it takes you just to take a step forward, like physically take a step forward and take another step. Think about how long it takes you physically just to talk and say a whole sentence. Everything is time-based, a specific time, type of time, right? Specific increments. So I remember I said this before and I was like, so imagine your brain's giving you all these thoughts, all these feelings all day. You're, you're manifesting as an experience, the most dominant one. That makes sense because you can't experience them all anyway in 16 hours of the day that you had those thousands or 60,000 thoughts or whatever it was. You don't even have enough time in the 16 hours that you thought 60,000 thoughts and had all these emotions. You don't have enough time to have all those experiences within those 16 hours. So we actually have enough computing power to keep producing an experience and a reality in front of us. Like what you're seeing right now, I'm seeing the computer, this microphone, my, you know, my whole space right now, whatever you're seeing right now, but whatever's behind you, whatever's outside, you don't see right now. It is like a video game in a video game. As you move forward, the rest of everything gets clearer and clearer and pictures start adding. But in a video game, the background is technically and everything you're not seeing is technically no longer in existence in a video game to save, you know, I guess space or whatever. I'm not a, you know, computer guy for, for the computer, you know, processing or whatever. I'm not sure. So it's not much computing power process that we need for the 16 hour reality it's not that much it's not that much experience most people are living in the same pattern anyway they're not just experiencing new things all the time that's not and it's still not even a lot of computing power necessary to live this bit this as a simulated reality because every time you move forward somewhere a new picture like a video game reveals itself reveals itself and you have a more than enough thoughts and feelings throughout your day to keep experiences coming over and over again in the right time increment so it's so easy to live in a simulated reality right now. And this avatar itself, this avatar itself, this, this brain you have right now can actually be the same type of the same type of thing that is the headset on the VR system. The headset. This avatar could be that. And this reality is just forming around us. You know, I always think about the holographic concept of a reality and how a lot of parts of you are like technology. Your eyes are like. When you have a camera on, your eyes are like the camera. It sees everything in its area, right? But if you move your camera right now, you're not going to move. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to move the whole reality. You're just, the camera is just going to change angles. But if you have a holographic, a holographic technology, right? Where the image is being shot out 3D. If you move the hologram technology, the whole image moves with it. Now, if you were to look at something straight, like that, whatever that is right there on the wall, and I move my eye, the image is moving. So we're more like a hologram, a holographic technology, projection type technology where the image is being projected out of us, but it's not just a regular hologram. Think about it. We already have technology to create holograms that are 3D. You can walk around, it looks real, looks like a real person. But when you touch it, obviously you can go right through it. You know, it's like a, like a ghost, I guess, in that sense. Now imagine if we created a, a holographic technology that doesn't just throw an image out that you can see and and it looks really real and it's 3d and everything but a 3d image that comes with you know the ability to actually feel it you know touch it and actually becomes it projects a holographic image that is actually 
physical, not just an image. Imagine technology like that, which is not too far-fetched. What if that is the avatar technology we're carrying and we're just literally easily creating this reality as we go with our thoughts and emotions and everything we feel most dominant about because there's more than enough time uh, based on the amount of thoughts we have to make that happen. So guys, I don't know. Your mind might be stretched right now. You might think I'm crazy. You might be like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Look, at the end of the day, go down the rabbit hole yourself. I think at the end of the day, all humans should be curious about their existence. I think all humans should be curious about their surroundings. What makes this? What makes it? I think these are questions that every human being has. Very few decide to go and do research like James Gates and other people out there that take that to the next level and become a profession out of it. But I think all humans have that natural tendency to question reality, to question what's real, to, to, to want to think outside the norm and outside the box. And uh, this is just one of those topics, guys. But I do want to hear from some of you, right? If you are seeing this on social media, YouTube, wherever, definitely comment below. I want to know what you know. And definitely get ready for Matrix Part 4. Notice how they did 12. They released the three days before Christmas, right? 12. The date is 12, 22, 21. What do you think that why they did that? The mirror effect. It's a mirror, right? 12, 22, 21. So I'm, I can't wait for that movie. Of course, guys, I'm interested to see what happens there. But guys, until the next episode of Down the Rabbit Hole, I want you to go down your own rabbit hole, do your research, discover more about yourself and the world you live in, because it ultimately is all very much empowering at the end of the day. All right, guys, that's pretty much.